Hi, thank you for watching Digging to China. I'm Dong Xiong. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. Today's news that I'm sharing with you is quite complex as it revolves around the Chinese economy. It may be challenging for viewers without economic knowledge to comprehend. And that's precisely the intention of the Chinese Communist Party. However, if we can decipher the true meaning behind the CCP's latest data, which they present as positive and promising, it becomes an intriguing endeavor. Even if you lack understanding economics and finance, I firmly believe that by the end of today's episode, you will have a solid grasp of the significant news being discussed. When it comes to understanding China's macro economy, some people hold a simplistic view. They doubt the authenticity of official data released by Beijing, assuming it is fabricated. However, completely rejecting all Chinese official data hampers the assessment of the Chinese economy. While their perspective may seem unrealistic, Disregarding official Chinese data leaves one without a foundation for studying China's macroeconomy. It is possible to analyze CCP's published data by identifying inaccuracies and reconciling inconsistencies to approach a more realistic understanding. Therefore, completely distrusting the CCP's official data is a not valid approach. Secondly, there are also people who maintain a pessimistic view of China regardless of the data presented. They hold a negative stance irrespective of the data provided. While this perspective holds some validity, I do not fully agree with allowing emotions to dictate our interpretation of data. We should not solely rely on our desired outcomes to shape our understanding. Instead, we should adjust our perspectives based on factual information. Admittedly, accurately observing the realities in China can be challenging due to the ambiguous and sometimes misleading nature of data released by the CCP. Nevertheless, we can still utilize this data to gain insights into the true situation in China. Without doing so, it would be difficult to grasp macroeconomy phenomena at play. On July 11th, the People's Bank of China, China Central Bank, released the social financing data for June. This data has been widely celebrated in China's official media and on Chinese social media platforms. It is seen as a rare instance of positive economic data for China since May. Let's delve into the details of this positive data and the news announced by the People's Bank of China, which has stirred up public opinion in China. On July 11th, the official website of the People's Bank of China made an announcement. During June, there was an increase of 3.05 trillion yuan in renminbi loans, representing a year-on-year -year growth of 230 billion yuan. The scale of social financing experienced an increment of 4.22 trillion yuan, surpassing the previous month by 2.67 trillion yuan, but showing a decrease of 986 billion yuan compared to the same period last year. During the first half of this year, there was a 15.73 trillion yuan increase in renminbi loans, representing a year-on-year -year growth of 2 trillion yuan. In comparison to the previous two months, June saw an improvement in the loan structure, with a notable increase in household loans that exceeded market expectations by a significant margin. During the first half of this year, there was a 20 trillion yuan increase in deposits, with a year-on-year -year growth of 1.3 trillion yuan. Among these, household deposits saw a significant increase of 11.9 trillion yuan, while non-financial corporate deposits increased by 5 trillion yuan. However, fiscal deposits experienced a decrease of 12.5 billion yuan. On the other hand, deposits from non-financial institutions witnessed a notable growth of 1 trillion yuan. Simultaneously, by the conclusion of June, there was a decrease in the year-on-year -year growth rates of both M2 and M1. 
Additionally, the scale of social financing witnessed an increment of 4.22 trillion yuan in June. Upon hearing the report from the People's Bank of China, you might be wondering about your reaction. The official Chinese media commonly uh, highlights the significant findings of the financial data report, especially for June, by emphasizing that financing exceeded market expectations and there was a notable resurgence in household loans. This implies that the scale of financing has expanded and there has been an increase in the number of individuals purchasing homes. These are the definitive assessments made by the official Chinese media based on the conclusions drawn from the data presented by the central bank. So, how should we interpret the data released by the central bank today? What kind of information does it convey to us? Does it indicate an improvement, a decline, or no significant change in the situation? Firstly, it is undeniable that the CCP possesses remarkable skills in statistical manipulation. Even when faced with unfavorable data, the CCP can still present impressive outcomes. For instance, if China undergoes an economic downturn, the CCP refrains from using the term decline and instead labels it as negative growth. Furthermore, if the economy continues to deteriorate, Xi Jinping would term it as high quality development, implying that ongoing decline represents a form of high quality progress. The CCP's adeptness in statistics and the politics enables them to transform negative situations into positive narratives. Was the financial data for June also manipulated to present the negative situations as a positive ones following the usual practice? It was undoubtedly a challenging task at this time. However, if you can comprehend the financial data for June, you will develop a more profound understanding of China's statistical methods. As evident from the data I just mentioned, it is adeptly presented. Firstly, they employed various comparison methods to manipulate the narrative. For instance, if there was a decline, they would selectively use year-on-year -year comparisons. If both month-on-month -month and year-on-year -year comparisons indicated a decline, they would resort to cumulative data, which would still portray growth. They consistently sought positive angles by switching comparison methods whenever unfavorable outcomes were possible. Even in the face of decline, they always managed to present growth. The central bank's report utilized these intricate tactics. For example, in the first half of 2023, the cumulative scale of social financing increased by 21.55 trillion yuan, which was more than 454 billion yuan higher than the same period last year. At the first glance, this data may seem impressive, and without a specialized knowledge, one might perceive it as a positive sign due to the increased scale. However, that is not the case because the month-to-month -month social financing scale in June actually decreased. A decline is considered negative news, and Xi Jinping is not inclined to acknowledge it. So. How do they transform negative news into positive news? They emphasize the cumulative increase compared to the same period last year. In reality, the monthly data for June indicates a decrease compared to the same period last year, but they strategically used cumulative increment data to divert attention from the decline in scale. This technique is employed to manipulate perceptions. Furthermore, as of the end of June, the total outstanding scale of social financing reached 365 trillion yuan, showing a 9% year-on-year increase. It is noteworthy that they specifically use the term outstanding scale, emphasizing the growth in scale. This is consistent with their approach of highlighting positive aspects. Similarly, in the second example, the increment is in the scale of social financing in June was reported as 4.22 trillion yuan, which was 6.67 trillion yuan higher than the previous month. However, when compared to the same period last year, it actually decreased by 986 billion yuan. 
Despite this decrease in the month-on-month -month increment, they manipulated the narrative by using a different reference point to create the impression of growth rather than decline. Hence, the data presented in the central bank's report employs intricate methods and a diverse benchmarks, aiming to present all data in a positive light with indications of growth. The National Bureau of Statistics of China similarly utilizes these techniques in their information releases. In economic data reporting, it is essential to maintain consistency in the measurement standards to accurately assess monthly changes. The CCP's tendency to employ ever-changing statistical methods is not scientifically reliable. The underlying purpose, easily understood by many, is to ensure that the Chinese population is consistently exposed to positive news. Furthermore, the most notable aspect of the financial data for June is the noteworthy increase in short-term and long-term loans for households. This stands out as the key highlight. Given that the reluctance of households to consume has been a concerning factor in China's macroeconomic indicators this year, the data for June demonstrates a slight improvement and a ray of hope in terms of consumption. Objectively speaking, this represents the most significant development. However, it remains uncertain whether this trend can be sustained in the long run. Thirdly, within the recent released financial data, among the various figures, there are indications of some challenges that reflect the difficult economic realities, which cannot be easily ignored from a statistical perspective. For instance, when converting foreign currency loans granted to the real economy into renminbi, the balance stood at 1.89 trillion yuan, showing a significant year-on-year -year decrease of 18.9%, approaching 20%, which is quite concerning. Trust loan balances reached 3.77 trillion yuan with a year-on-year -year decline of 5%. The balance of undiscounted uh, bank acceptance bills was 2.75 trillion yuan, showing a year-on-year -year decrease of 2.8%. Corporate bond balances were 31.34 trillion yuan with a year-on-year -year decline of 0.4%. However, in contrast, government bond balances increased significantly to 63.57 trillion with a year-on-year -year growth of 10%. Analyzing this data reveals that while corporate financing remains stagnant or declining, there is substantial growth in government bonds. It is evident from these figures that the funds are not benefiting business but rather being channeled towards the government. Fourthly, the announced M1 year-on-year -year growth rate was only 3.1%, while M2 exhibited a year-on-year -year growth of 11.3%. The scissor gap between M2 and M1 widened to 8.2, compared to the previous month's gap of 6.8. What does this data indicate? The scissor gap signifies a substantial amount of idle funds that have not been effectively utilized for productive consumption or transformed into loans to st stimulate investment and spending. The larger the scissor gap, the greater the proportion of idle funds. This phenomenon known as fund idling occurs when loans are predominantly used for debt repayment rather than being directed towards productive investments and consumption. This trend is evident, and in June, it worsened as the proportion of idle funds increased. Fifthly, let's explore the nature of monthly financial data and the concept of social financing scale and their relationships with economic growth. In theory, higher investment should lead to greater economic growth. The growth in social financing scale and the financial sector should be proportionate to GDP. However, in recent years, we have witnessed a growing disconnect between the growth rate of social financing scale and the GDP. This disparity indicates a reality of fund circulation where the impact of increased monetary injection is diminishing, and the efficiency of money is declining. For example, in the first quarter of this year, the social financing scale increased by 9%, while GDP growth was only 4.5%. 
Former Finance Minister Lo Ji Wei highlighted the need for China to transition from an investment driven growth model to a consumption driven one, which is a valid concept. However, some economists argue that China's current growth model is not solely reliant on investment, as investment growth has not been rapid since 2015. Instead, China has become debt driven, with debt serving as the primary driver of GDP growth. This perspective, shared by publications like the Wall Street Journal and Reuters, highlights the significance of debt in shaping China's economic growth. Given that investment should prioritize efficiency, and the observed financial data points to a substantial decline in the efficiency of China's financial system. Today's presentation of the financial data for June by the People's Bank of China offers us a concrete glimpse into reality. However, when it comes to releasing economic data, the CCB tends to be less transparent. They often manipulate statistical methods to present a more favorable picture, making it challenging to make meaningful comparisons. Despite these manipulations, preliminary analysis reveals that within the highly acclaimed financial data for June, there are still several unfavorable aspects. Therefore, the overall evaluation is that the financial data for June does not represent a significant deterioration or improvement. It can be regarded as slightly better than the situation in May. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, be well.